Thank you all for joining us. Um, we are assembled again, the four of us, I'll introduce us in a minute, uh, were together last month to talk about anticipated issues and legal issues um, in the uh, presidential election. Uh, one of the points that the four of us take a little pride in is that we all thought that a Bush v. Gore type replay, a Supreme Court decision in a single state was exceedingly unlikely and that legal challenges would take place under the framework of much more detailed state law practices. And as we will discuss shortly, we invoked for the, uh, for the I think for the education uh, of most of our audience that was not aware of this, this lurking issue about the independent state legislature doctrine buried within the electors clause of Article Two of the Constitution. And in so doing, we raised the prospect that there could be the what we termed at the time a nuclear option played and that why uh, that had not been done before and how dangerous it would be if there were an attempt to simply uh, replace the apparent will of the voters in the electoral process with the substitution of electors by the, the legislature, by the state legislature in any given state. I would like to say that we passed around a note among the four of us afterwards and we all collectively predicted exactly 306 to 323, but that may be uh, pushing credulity just a little bit too far. But, uh, but that was the table that we set a month ago and now we are back and clearly these, these are the critical issues of the day. And today begins the next phase of the process. Today is uh, the date for the certification of the electors in Georgia. Monday is that for Michigan, and then it starts to take on a different form legally. So uh, let me introduce um, our panelists, uh, go in the order in which I see them. Uh, ben Ginsburg is a retired partner from Jones Day. Ben has been a longtime uh, legal advisor, legal strategist uh, for the Republican Party. Uh, Fernita Tolson is a professor of law at USC. Uh, and uh, Rick Pildes uh, is uh, my colleague here at NYU. I'm Sam Zakroff. I'm also an NYU professor. And we are privileged to have basically the CNN Legal Brain Trust all <laughs> assembled here for us uh, uh, this evening, uh, this, this morning. Um, so let's start with uh, getting to setting the table. Where are we right now? So Fernita, maybe you could give uh, the audience a brief primer on what actually is going on and what actually happens next and how do we happen to select a president at the end of this process? So first, let me say thank you for having me and also happy Georgia certification day, right? <laughs> I feel like we can finally start to take a breath. Um, I have to be honest, I didn't predict that we would be quite in this place a month ago, but um, I'm, I'm happy that we are not in the Bush versus Gore world, which is a good thing. Um, so Georgia certifies today. Um, I think Michigan and Pennsylvania is certified next week and, and so on. So over the next couple, couple of weeks, you'll have states certifying uh, their results have an, an official winner. Um, and so that winner's slate of electors, um, since if, if all disputes are resolved by December 8th, Congress will treat that slate as presumptively valid. Uh, the electors meet on December 14th, they cast their ballots. Um, and then Congress meets on January 6th, they count the votes. Um, and then they determine who the winner is. And hopefully we won't have too many hiccups where we have to do a program in another month <laughs> to see where we are. Um, but uh, with respect to the current litigation, that's why you see so many efforts to delay or block certification in part because certification is, is really sort of the, the sign that it's over, right? The state has certified the results. Um, the states that are most in contention have you know, chosen Joe Biden and then it becomes very difficult at that point uh, for President Trump to, to be able to overturn those results. So um, that hopefully is enough of an overview, Sam, but, but Fingers crossed. <laughs> but uh, for Nia, let me just stay with you for a second. Okay, the, sure. These processes that are unfolding now are just administrative processes normally. They normally have no bearing. If you remember back, uh, I certainly do 20 years to the Bush v. Gore, uh, 
there was this live TV footage of ballots being taken by van from, uh, from the various county boards to Tallahassee. And they made this into uh, just a dramatic TV event. And it was just that they didn't have FedEx. You know? <laughs> they were just bringing the ballots up there. And so we had the, the Wayne State, the Wayne County Board rebel. We have uh, President Trump inviting Michigan. Uh, we're gonna turn to Michigan specifically in a minute, but is, are these supposed to be routine activities? How, what's going on here essentially? Um, so it is, it's supposed to be really boring. I think um, Rick made the point in some event that we was at at some point in the last few <laughs> weeks that, it's all a bit right, <laughs> about how boring it is, right? They, they had live streams that were, you know, sort of overseeing the counting and it's just, it's, 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 it's supposed to be really, really boring. So what happened in Wayne County, it felt like theater uh, where you had initially the board deadlock 2-2 two, two, two on whether or not to certify uh, the election results. But but even then, there are state processes in place to sort of check that. So if that board locks, uh, deadlocks, then it goes to the state canvassing board, right? So you have these different steps in the, in the process that uh, tries to keep it as boring as possible. It's just that given that we, we, everything is kind of like very high tension, there's so much litigation, there are strong feelings, our levels of polarization, it became made for TV. Uh, but I think our baseline is boring, and that's a good thing. So Rick, uh, boring cues you up uh, here. Um, so thank you, I appreciate it. Um, so, but let's uh, let's turn to Michigan in particular. You have this terrific op-ed about to come out in the Times, where you go very granular on uh, the Michigan processes, and this is something. You know, we've been in this field together for almost 30 years now, and uh, perhaps more than 30 years, I can't remember, but- uh, uh, That shows you how long it's been. <laughs> uh, it's been, and I don't think the two of us have ever had a discussion about the process of Michigan certification of the vote, even though you spent a long time at the University of Michigan and lived there, I doubt you had any awareness of this. So. What give us Michigan as an example of how the legal system is supposed to work, and also I think quite critically where the frailties are, how it could break down. Yes, and that last comment is a, is a good way of sort of framing this, which is, uh, you know, our election system was put under a tremendous stress test in this election because of the virus and all of the changes that had to be required um, to run the election smoothly. The election process actually passed that test um, surprisingly well, but now our post-election processes are being put under a similar kind of stress test, except in this context, the stresses are being put on the system by the president and the president's campaign, uh, which is looking for any points of vulnerability that they might be able to exploit to try to somehow magically change the outcome uh, of the election uh, across a number of states, of course, that would, where that would have to take place. So uh, states have different structures for the power to actually certify the election results, that is to finally make the legal determination who has won the vote in that state. Um, in many states, it's a single actor like the Secretary of State but Michigan has this system which goes back to their constitution, pre-Civil War constitution, actually, 1850, where they have these four member boards, first at the county level, then ultimately at the state level, that are the entity that does the formal work of certifying the election totals. And these boards in Michigan, uh, by law, uh, have two Republicans and two Democratic members on them. Um, just as, a, and as, as an aside, we have always worried about commissions or other entities that have an even number of members on them uh, because that does create the possibility of a, of a gridlock. <laughs> so in any event, um, uh, the counties have finished their processes. They've transmitted their totals to the state and the state canvassing board just has a very ministerial task at this point, which is essentially just adding up the numbers that have come from all of the counties. But because there are two Republicans and two Democrats on the board, uh, the president's campaign is, is obviously bringing um, as much pressure as they can bring to bear on those two Republicans to get them not to agree to certify the total in Michigan on Monday, 
Um, and then if the board is deadlocked, uh, there are various questions about, you know, what might happen next. Um, the Trump campaign would, you know, live on to fight another day if they can de delay or avoid certification. Um, that's clearly what uh, is in play here in Michigan. Uh, but, you know, it's not as if uh, the Michigan political system or the governor of Michigan in particular are going to just sit there idly by if this actually were to happen. And, and by the way, I don't want to say in advance that these two Republican board members uh, are, are certainly going to give in to this pressure. Uh, they may very well not. They may perform their duty. This may all be over on Monday in Michigan. But if they don't, and if the vote gets deadlocked uh, two to two or, or is on the verge of, of that happening, uh, the governor has various powers in Michigan uh, to remove board members, uh, to replace board members. Uh, uh, the Biden campaign will go to court, undoubtedly. Uh, they will seek a, what we call a writ of mandamus, uh, ordering the board to certify the results because there's an absolutely clear legal duty here that they have at this point. Um, the, the court may uh, uh, order the board to certify. The court could conceivably even certify uh, the numbers itself. So, you know, it's not as if, um, I mean, each of these moves the Trump campaign is making um, is not something, are not moves that happen in a vacuum. And other actors have significant legal powers if they are forced to bring them to bear in a, you know, horrible situation. Uh, that we should not be facing if, if there's any risk that the canvassing board is not going to do its clear legal duty and just add up the numbers and get done with it. Ben, let me turn to you because um, you've been involved in these campaigns at the local level, at the national level. You were counsel to the uh, chief counsel to the Romney campaign in, uh, in 2012. Um, these entities uh, are, are largely unknown to the broad public and even to the insiders, we tend to treat them, I think I'm not speaking we, and you can correct me if this is wrong, as simply a mechanical act at the end of the day. They seem designed for handling the local affairs of the state. How does this translate it once you expand the scope into a national election, to a presidential election? I mean, what Rick just described is, a technical matter of almost administrative law of the state of Michigan. Is that really where the presidential election is going to be decided? Well, it might be. I mean, what's, what's really interesting about the way we run our elections is that so much of this does actually get made up by local officials. The 10,500 jurisdictions we have that are responsible for the casting and counting of ballots. If, uh, if the spotlight shines on them, then the tasks aren't ministerial in something like the presidential election. And we certainly saw that with local officials in Florida during 2000 or in any number of other recounts, probably the Coleman Franken one in 2008 um, being another example. But a Senate election. A Senate election, yes. Um, but there are, look, there, just, to, just to sort of talk about these local institutions that they're in their time in the sun and the stress tests involved. Rick has really well laid out the Michigan process, but there's also a provision of Michigan law that allows the state canvassing board to ask for more time if there are major questions. So this does not have to be a 2-2 deadlock. It can be, we have questions and we'd like these uh, questions answered before we go forward. And if you really want to play out the chess match in Michigan, the two Republican members would not deny certification. They would say, we have these questions about precincts being out of balance, or we have reports of fraudulent elections. They can ask for, I believe it's up to 20 days. It is possible to go to the courts. Uh, and of course, we would never ascribe partisan motives to a state Supreme Court. But Michigan State Supreme Court justices run nonpartisan, but they're nominated by the political parties. So the current makeup of the Michigan uh, Supreme Court is four Republicans and three Democrats, at least from their party nominations. So it is not at all clear if the governor tries to take this up or the governor tries to appoint somebody. 
that the state Supreme Court will, will back her up. It's also worth noting that that makeup of the Michigan Supreme Court flips on January 1st uh, so that it becomes four Democrat and three Republican. So there is a, a mechanism for this being slowed down enough by the state canvassing board that uh, if it goes past December 8th, which again is possible with the Michigan Supreme Court ruling, then you have the legislature capable of stepping into a uncertified election and, uh, and naming a, a slate of electors. So this is not necessarily done in, in Michigan. Uh, it is a desperate strategy. I think ultimately it fails because the institutions uh, and the overwhelming vote will take place. The Michigan legislative Republican leaders have all said that, um, or both said that uh, they're, they're in favor of the state processes playing out. Uh, I guess the, the master negotiator in the White House will take his opportunity today to try and get him to change their mind. But uh, Michigan serves as a perfect example of how the usually ministerial forms of government uh, get subject to a different, different kind of stress test and chess game in moments like this. So when we talk a little bit later about ways where we might reform our system, this could be one of them. Um, for Nita, let's, let's now go to the Bush v. Gore analogy because um, what ultimately went to the Supreme Court was uh, the, the efforts made by the Gore campaign to stop the certification of the Florida vote and the alteration of processes was what was the trigger for it's complicated opinion, but either the due process or the equal protection side, depending on whether you read the, the plurality opinion or the, the uh, concurrent. Um, what um, uh, this seems to me to be the exact same play here. That is, yeah. the Trump campaign has put all its uh, its chips on uh, stopping the certification. Uh, what's what what gives I mean what what's the significant can that I mean, obviously we haven't seen this play out successfully but right. could this work you know I don't think so uh, but I, I agree that that's the play if you look at the nature of some of the claims that's being made so um, uh, the claim in one of the Pennsylvania lawsuits is that there's an equal protection problem because some counties allow voters to cure their ballots but not others um, and so voters are essentially being treated differently um, there was also a claim in, I forget which state at this point, uh, that, you know, having different processes for vote by mail versus in-person voting violated the Equal Protection Clause. And so you, you see these, these claims ba based on differential treatment of voters. And I, I do view that as kind of a Bush versus Gore strategy. Um, but I don't read Bush versus Gore standing for the proposition that counties cannot treat voters differently. Um, particularly counties within a, within a state. Um, it, instead, it's, it's more so about, because of course, if that's true, then essentially our entire election apparatus is unconstitutional because counties do this within the state all the time. They have different voting technologies. They have different processes. And so that, that, that will be a very extreme reading of Bush versus Gore. Uh, but that being said, uh, one of the reasons why and why I find comfort, uh, where I find comfort is the fact that there isn't uh, much evidence backing up any of these claims. And I keep coming back to that because I think it's really important to emphasize it that a lot of these cases are asking for courts to, um, uh, for preliminary injunctions and temporary restraining orders based on this argument that if you grant this order, then, then we'll find evidence, right? If you, if you allow it, it's, it's basically a, a, a ploy for more time, but that's not how litigation works, right? And so Bush versus Gore is different to me because uh, the equal protection problems were very apparent on their face, regardless if you agree with the decision or not, right? There's something wrong with uh, uh, post-election, you know, your vote counts uh, depending on where you live. I don't think that many people would necessarily quibble with that, although they may quibble with the remedy. Um, but, but generally speaking, uh, if a court was to adopt that type of rationale in the context of these cases, that would be an extreme extension of Bush versus Gore. And I think something that Bush versus Gore wasn't intended to stand for. So on, on, uh, before turning to Rick, I just wanna go back to Ben for a second. On TV, I, I saw you uh, smilingly uh, note that uh, 
your team in Bush v. Gore, you had uh, two future solicitors general, you had three of the current members of the US Supreme Court, you have a dean of a uh, well-regarded law school in Cambridge, Massachusetts, you have people uh, of outstanding stature, and you seem to think that the current representation of the Trump campaign in court didn't quite meet that standard. Did I mishear you, Ben? <laughs> no, I haven't been with as distinguished a group as I was in Florida till this call, in fact. <laughs> uh, no, look, the, the, this is a, um, the, the team that Trump has and the legal strategy, uh, and legal strategy should always be in air quotes for this uh, series of cases. Uh, was not formed precisely the way we did in Bush versus Gore, nor in the timing. I mean, to the, to the everlasting credit of James Baker, uh, by the Friday after the election, we had put out the call to, to many really excellent litigators, but also the whole former Supreme Court clerk network. And we had uh, teams ready to go on the Friday after the election of really incredible talent and, and depth. Uh, that was not what the Trump campaign has done. Uh, you know, they, to, to Fernita's point, they didn't have those people even in the pre-election litigation, the 40 cases that were brought in the name of the Trump campaign or the RNC. They had a terrible track record on those. Uh, and at this stage in the process, um, uh, they have they have recruited um, Rudy Giuliani to lead the effort, and probably that can just stay as a declarative sentence. <laughs> um, Rick, uh, uh, going back to the point about stress tests, um, uh, Ben mentioned the Coleman Franken uh, election contest in uh, Minnesota that played out according to every technical detail of Minnesota law. It went to the Supreme Court. It was handled by competent top lawyers. It was a well done election challenge and it was resolved definitively by the Minnesota courts uh, nine months after the election. That can't happen in a presidential election. So when you talk about stress tests, there's a measure in which there needs to be improvisation by these institutions that have never been challenged this way. And there can't be all the normal trappings of endless judicial review and process. So give a sense of how you see this playing out or how it should play out given the, the incredible legal uncertainty over how any of this was designed to work. Yeah, so the, the presidency is obviously a unique institution in American government. It's headed by a single person, and it's simply unacceptable, both constitutionally, but in some political sense, to not have complete continuity uh, of government. Um, and it also takes time for an administration coming in to put together its team, get informed, and be ready to hit the ground running on January 20th. So people need to appreciate that in this context, sort of uniquely among all other offices, the process has to get to closure far earlier than for any other office. And as you mentioned, of course, it's absolutely in intolerable to go through a process like in the Minnesota Senate race that would take nine months. In fact, uh, federal law requires uh, the electors to vote six weeks after election day um, and that's sort of a, a drop dead date. Um, and that's an unbelievably tight time frame to deal with lots and lots of, of claims. So it creates a lot of stress on the court system among many other places. Um, and one of the things that's just beginning to kind of come more clearly into focus is that we always have this problem in election cases that you can run to both state and federal court. It's very easy now to convert most state claims into a version of a federal constitutional claim. Um, and you get the parallel court systems. And there's a big question about whether the federal courts should actually stay out of adjudicating legal issues in the context of a presidential election, 
and require those cases to go through the state court system and then Supreme Court review if that's appropriate. Because as soon as federal courts are also involved with state courts, you increase the risk greatly that the process will start getting dragged out uh, and begin to bump up against the five week date for the safe harbor provision or the six week date for when the electors have to vote. Um, and that's a huge issue that we have not actually kind of adequately, <laughs> adequately confronted. Federal courts are hearing these claims as well as state courts. The federal courts are dismissing all of them you know, fairly quickly, but, but they're not saying it, it's not our role to get in the way of the states completing the process of certifying the votes and to channel any legal claims through state court, um, including federal claims, if there are any. So, so, so that's a stress test on the court system. You know, can the courts work this out implicitly so that they do not become tools that are used to drag this process out, even if the claims are ultimately not very solid legal claims, and yet create all of the turmoil that would result um, if there's a risk that a, an important decisive state can't finish its process by the safe harbor date <clears throat> or the date the electors um, have, to, have to vote. Um, so it's absolutely imperative, and I assume most judges do have uh, full awareness of this. These things have to be dealt with as quickly as possible. Uh, sometimes I think even rejecting claims without writing full opinions with the opinions to follow, you know, would be a, a, a good thing for courts to do. Um, so far, the courts have not become tools of delay, but that's a serious risk and the courts shouldn't let themselves be used in that way, um, you know, given the extraordinary time pressures on getting to closure uh, in a presidential election, unless there are very serious claims with evidence that are brought forward. And, you know, we have not seen that uh, to this point. Yes, I, go ahead. Can I, can I just jump in? Cause I think that's a really important point. And it makes me wonder if that's why we're starting to see the independent state legislature doctrine be more aggressive, like, you know, come to the fore, because wouldn't that make a lot of this go away, right? If you have this aggressive use of the independent state legislature doctrine to say the state legislature has the authority to set the rules and even state courts are limited in their ability to change those rules. Um, and I wonder if there's this broader concern about courts being used in a way that Rick describes. Um, so for better or worse, because I think the doctrine is a bit of a, a disaster, but I do think that there is this concern that courts would be um, put in a position of resolving a presidential election in a way that would do more damage than just aggressively using this doctrine. I, I think that may be a very real concern and the courts have responded in a couple of ways. Recall that in Florida in 2000, there was parallel federal litigation and it was basically put on hold uh, pending what the what this Florida state courts were going to do. And there's an odd technical issue that uh, uh, Rick and I uh, spend a lot of pages on going in, playing out in our casebook uh, with Pam Carlin and Nate, Pil uh, uh, Nate personally. Um, on most of the federal interest is in faithful compliance with state law. So there's a question about when it becomes right. But there's a question about when it had when who has standing in all of these kinds of claims and. Uh, Rick, Ben, and I were on opposite sides, but we spent a fair amount of time in the courts leading up to the 2012 elections. And one of the things that I thought the courts did admirably, particularly in Ohio, which was seen as the fulcrum of that election, was they said, we're open for business. We're open weekends. We're open night times. You have a dispute. Don't wait till after the election. Come here right away and everybody did you know we uh, you know you build it they will come we came and most of the issues were resolved ahead of the election and were resolved relatively relatively quickly and rick and i have a piece in which we discuss uh how standing went by the wayside, ripeness went by the wayside all these kind of federal courtsy issues it was just we can't afford to have delay here because of the impact on the election. Ben, is that your how you remember that also? I, I, I yeah. may have been on a different side, but. Yeah, it's, it's how I remember it. And I also think it was true in 2020, actually. I mean, there was a lot of pre-election litigation this time. 
all of which with the possible exception of the Pennsylvania case that you referred to, right. um, well, really got resolved and there was not ambiguity in the individual states. So uh, Ben, let's go, let's go to uh, Rick's uh, and Fernita's broader point about uh, the independent state legislature doctrine emerging from the shadows of courts not being avenues of delay or perhaps not being perceived as avenues of delay at this point. You think there's something to that? Yeah, I mean, I do think there's something to that. I, I, I So let me pick up on something Fernita said, because I think it's worth discussing, that if you actually provide all the authority to the state legislatures um, without really much judicial review, and that's probably where the Pennsylvania case is, is uh, going to be decided by the Supreme Court. You do have, at least in this case in Pennsylvania, roughly half of the population thinking that the legislature pulled a political hack job in the way they handled the election. And so I, I think we're in, and I'm not sure that the independent legislature being the sole and final authority, although I think that's what the constitution says, but I'm not sure that's a politically um, palatable argument really. So I'm not, I'm not sure where this is going. I, I think you know if you have split control of a legislature, then you've got a much stronger case, but if, both, but if one party controls both chambers, then all of a sudden the, the partisan implications of what they do becomes much, much stronger. No, I went back at one point and read the legislative debates about the Electoral Count Act, and uh, which was passed by Congress after our most fractious election since 1800, the 1876 Hayes-Tilden dispute. And there was a debate on just these grounds, which is what's the ultimate body that the population would accept as having the say on the presidential election. And there was a discussion of perhaps this should be vested in the Supreme Court. And that was rejected. And I think it was Representative Sumner who very forcefully argued that if it ever came to a Supreme Court decision, the court would be seen as partisan. And so we would have the tarnish of two of the branches of government, and one of which is supposed to be the non-political branch. And so the decision was made to kick it into the Congress. That's the ultimate structure of the Electoral Count Act. But um, before we get to that, uh, Fernita, uh, again, I'm trying to keep, we have a big audience and not everybody knows all the deal. Can you, or can somebody set the table on what the Pennsylvania case is and how the independent state legislature doctrine is teed up there? Because that's still technically pending before the Supreme Court. Right. Um, so, you know, in some ways we dodged a bullet because, you know, the uh, Pennsylvania, they decided, the election administrators decided to segregate the ballots that will be at issue because of this case. Um, and so it involved uh, the ballot uh, receipt deadline being extended by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court uh, three, day, three days past election day. Um, and the argument is that that's a change to the election rules um, and that the state legislature is the only body that has the power to do that. And so that's why the independent state legislature doctrine is relevant to that case. Um, and so that case, uh, the, the Supreme Court uh, declined to um, alter the Pennsylvania Supreme Court decision twice before the election. Um, in, one, in one particular instance, they deadlocked 4-4 uh, with four justices being sort of open to this argument about the independent state legislature. And so it's a question of how uh, the new justice, Justice uh, Coney Barrett will, um, how she will view the doctrine because the case is still pending before the Supreme Court. Can I say something about this litigation, by the way, that's gonna be a, a, probably a little bit of a surprising twist to hear. Um, so, you know, first of all, people should understand there are not enough ballots at stake in this dispute about the three-day extension for the deadline for receiving them after election day. Um, so let's just put that to the side. Um, there's about 10,000 ballots involved. The margin for Biden on net from those ballots might be 5,000 votes. So it, it has no bearing. Uh, even if the court were to hear the case, decide to accept the claim, and decide the proper remedy was to treat those as invalid votes. So I think that's important to say. Secondly, I think it's important to put um, into the picture here that 
it's also conceivable that if the court decides those ballots were cast illegally, it might decide it's still not appropriate to sort of retroactively invalidate them. It might even make its remedy kind of prospective. But the important point I want to make is, um, and it's probably hard to hear this in the context with all of the kind of uh, absurd cases that have been brought, but this is a serious legal issue. Uh, and uh, there are going to be significant benefits ultimately from the Supreme Court actually deciding this question. It would bring a lot of clarity to a whole series of issues that now are coming up constantly in federal election cases. Um, the court might decide only the state legislature you know, has standing to bring these kinds of claims that its authority has been abused by the state Supreme Court or the Secretary of State. Um, that would be incredibly clarifying for the future. Um, and we would know that's the only plaintiff here. If the court does accept the case, um, it, might just, it might reject the argument, maybe partly for the reasons Ben says, that would be incredibly clarifying. If it accepts the claim, it will have to say something about, well, what is the scope of the independent power the legislature has in the state over federal elections? That would be clarifying. So sort of perversely, I mean, one of the, one of the defects I think of the American legal system, but it's deeply you know, baked into the way we do things is that courts won't adjudicate cases until there is a, what they call a concrete case or controversy. And that means you can't go into court very easily, federal court, and get clarification about the legal rules connected to the election, unless you can show there's that kind of concreteness. Um, and when you have a disputed election, that's sort of the worst time for courts to actually be brought in to answering these questions, because everybody knows, including the judges, which candidate's gonna be better off or worse off from a ruling one way or the other. And especially if the stakes are high, I think it's virtually inevitable, especially in our current political culture, that whichever side loses is going to be convinced the court acted against them for partisan reasons. So this is a great opportunity, in a sense, with this Pennsylvania case, because when the court decides this case, nothing's going to be at stake for this election. And so they will be in a position in which they will be in kind of a veil of ignorance, you know, about who might benefit, who might be disadvantaged in the future from whatever decisions they make about this, you know, definitely uh, vital or, you know, it's a live, it's a very live legal question. And if we go into the next elections, whether it's the midterms or particularly the 2024 presidential election, without these issues being clarified, it's going to be a constant problem. And so I'm all in favor of the court hearing this case and clarifying what the rules are. I think the, the, we will actually benefit in future elections if the court defines what the ground rules are with respect to this important doctrine or important debate, I should say. Right, just Sam, I, 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 certainly, I, I certainly agree with that. I think the court acted very responsibly in this case because they did not take it for the heat of the 2020 election. It is an important issue. The other issue they might actually deal with here is, does election day mean election day? Or is it uh, many days before, but in this particular case, can it be days after also? Can you receive absentee ballots postmarked on election day after the fact, or do they have to be uh, in on election day. So there are a couple of, of really important issues that this case surfaces. And I, I think it's a disservice to both the courts and the parties to consider this as a 2020 go to the Supreme Court to, to decide the outcome of the election, whatever uh, rhetoric uh, Donald Trump may have used. Right, I, I think that there's a temptation right now to subsume everything in the frivolous quality of most of the Trump uh, lawsuits, which have no evidence. And as Fernita said earlier, uh, come in with the claim of, you have to give us an injunction because that way we might find evidence. 
uh, which is exactly the opposite of the four characteristic factors that use for preliminary injunction, one being likelihood of prevailing on the merits. You got to show it at the injunction stage. But leaving that aside, you have this one legal issue, which actually has been lurking in the background. And for folks who don't follow it completely technically, when the Constitution says that the state legislature shall determine the manner in which electors are selected, does that mean the state legislature acting as a standalone body, or does it mean that it's a the state legislature acting pursuant to the normal operation of state law, which includes gubernatorial presentment, which includes uh, uh, the judicial review under the state uh, bodies. And one can argue this either way, but Ben, you said something before that was kind of provocative about that. You said that we can no longer tolerate um, a reading of this that would create this standalone body in the legislature um, because it seems at odds with the way we've been doing business for a couple hundred years. Well, what, what, what I meant by that was, is it a good, is it a good policy? Is that right. actually, will it be accepted if you leave it only to a legislature without any judicial review? Um, and, you know, that's going to get into the interpretation that hopefully the Supreme Court gives all of this. But I think there are, there are uh, upsides to leaving it just with the legislature, but also downsides in terms of the partisan nature that those decisions would have. And by the way, I, I don't, I'm not sure this matters legally, but it's interesting that the Pennsylvania Supreme Court is popularly elected. They're not appointed. So there are candidates on the ballot as well. And does that have an impact on the definition of legislature somehow? So let's go to a point, Ben, that, that Rick raised, which is that it would be good to have clarification of this before the next round of elections. The fact is this has been lurking in the Constitution since 1789 and has never really surfaced before. And so the idea that there's tremendous gain to be had from the court issuing not quite an advisory opinion, but an, a, a, a low stakes opinion for clarification raises the question of how come this has never come up before? How come we've never, nobody has tried to play this card. Nobody's doing what's happening today of inviting the legislators to the White House to twist arms to get them to try to overturn the, the voting outcome. Why, why are we playing nuclear games now? <laughs> well, this is what we, we sort of call the fickle finger of recount fate pointing uh, kind of randomly at a weak link in the system that you don't think of before. I mean, I'm not sure what the reason is that it surfaced in 2020, other than the particular actors involved in it, looking for, um, looking for every sort of, a, of an angle. And, you know, there, there are a whole series of issues that we've never had to face before that have surfaced um, this time. And I, you know, honestly, I don't know what the, the answer is as to, as to why we've, we've dodged that fickle finger of fate up until so, now. So no, let me just jump in for a second here. So it's not clear to me, and I'm not a, a, a deep expert on this, uh, that this is the first time this issue has surfaced because uh, during the Civil War, there was a similar debate about this issue. Uh, many state constitutions required voting in person. Uh, and uh, uh, Republicans, Lincoln Republicans, wanted the soldiers who were out on the battlefield to be able to vote. Uh, and a number of states, actually Michigan is one of the more prominent ones, passed laws permitting soldiers to vote from the battlefield this, despite the state constitution. Um, and the argument was exactly this argument. It's the legislature under the US Constitution that has the power to determine the rules for a presidential election. Now, I know that controversy occurred back then, and I'm certain that the soldiers actually were able to vote. Um, I don't know, because I haven't looked into this more deeply, whether there were actual court decisions that specifically uh, addressed this issue. Uh, but I know the issue did come up. Uh, earlier, and then it was latent 
for a long, long, long time uh, until creative lawyers uh, under the pressure of a 537 vote margin in Florida, you know, figured out every possible legal avenue they might pursue. And then you had three justices on the Supreme Court who accepted the argument. And then of course it had a, a, a life of its own after that. Then it became a viable claim to pursue. Yeah, why, well, had, why did McPherson come back to life in right. 2000 yeah. after it'd been dormant since 1876? McPherson for our audience is the one Supreme Court case that addressed the independent state legislature doctrine back from the late 19th century. And it never came up in the court again until the companion case or the prior case to Bush v. Gore, which was Bush v. Palm Beach County. But Fernita, whenever we get into the history of, of obscure debates on the right to vote and how they play, mm -hmm. I always to you. So uh, yeah, I'm happy to, to chime in. I, I do think that um, to Rick's point, this was a live issue during a civil war, but um, I can't call any cases that come to mind, but um, I do know that Lincoln, um, you know, sort of implored upon his generals to send the soldiers home for the, to those states that wouldn't allow them to vote from the battlefield, right? So um, it, there wasn't any, you know, uniform action on this front. And so that's probably why there weren't any court cases, because either the state legislatures changed the rules or the soldiers, you know, were sent uh, home to vote. Uh, but I do, I want to make a, a, a related point about the, the clarity issue versus the merits issue. Uh, so so I, I appreciate the point that, you know, when the Supreme Court resolves this decision, it'll give us clarity moving forward. But I cannot shake the feeling of like doom I have about what the potential outcome will be. <laughs> and maybe the, the clarity is worth it. But, you know, to me, it seems like a lot of this will require opening up um, questions that have been recently resolved in the case law about whether legislature means legislature. Um, and, you know, one thing that is very striking about our history is our, if, if anything, it's our lack of consistency on many of these issues, right? So things tend to come to the fore when they are immediately relevant. But when we look to the past, often you will find that we're just not consistent. Like Congress does, for example, in the 1911 Reapportionment Act, Congress allows states to use independent commissions in order to draw um, congressional districts. Like they didn't necessarily require the legislature or any entity to, um, to draw those districts themselves. And so you have sort of this patchwork in our history about how these questions of if the legislature means legislature, how that has been approached. And so, uh, yes, we'll have clarity, but at the same time, as we are, we sit on the eve of an another redistricting cycle, the, the implications of how the court resolves this case should not be lost on us. Uh, we could potentially see them go back on a case that was decided less than five years ago about legislature sort of incorporating whatever lawmaking procedures the state has in place um, to a very narrow view of what legislature means based on article two and, and article one. And so that worries me, um, even though I can appreciate the clarity point, I just think that this court has not been friendly to voting rights, has not been friendly to uh, political participation more broadly. And so I just think we can't forget that. Rick, uh, you've written about this a lot, but I think Fernita's point raises a kind of a fundamental issue about this entire field of law, which is we live in a, in a very democratic time. We have immediacy of connection through uh, social media. We have the perception that the people must have their will uh, allowed in all manner of things. Certainly uh, the current president has been uh, a champion of that, but we have a, a constitutional text and structure that vests powers in strange institutions such as the Electoral College or the independent state legislature. So you have this ongoing tension between the democratic ethos of the time and the formal structures. And for the most part, the courts have allowed the formal structures to cede to the commands of democracy, uh, including recognizing political parties, including recognizing the nomination process and things of that sort. How does this play out in this uh, particular context? Hmm, that's a really interesting question to ponder. So, uh, you know, of course, there's a difference between institutions that are hardwired into the Constitution, you know, where it's very clear there's an electoral college. And it's hard for me to believe that if we were today writing a, a structure for choosing a president on a blank slate, that that's the structure we would choose. But 
because it is in the Constitution and because we have one of the hardest constitutions in the world to amend, um, it's uh, you know certainly not something the courts are going to change. Um, and whether there's ever enough political uh, consensus to make that change, uh, who knows? Um, so features like that, the courts really can't do anything with uh, to adapt to the sort of more modern democratic sensibility. I, I think one of the best examples of the court doing what you described though is the recent case last year about this whole faith, faithless electors debate um, in which uh, you know, the issue is our, our electors constitutionally meant to be free to vote for whomever they think in their conscience they ought to vote for despite the popular vote in a state. And can states bind them and punish them, uh, bind them to vote for the popular vote winner and then punish them if they don't in various ways. Um, I think the, you know, argument from the original history that they were meant to have this freedom of choice was pretty strong, actually. Uh, but the Supreme Court unanimously held, despite that, that states could bind the electors uh, to vote for the popular vote winner. Um, and I think Justice Kagan's opinion kind of skirted over that original history and didn't really engage with it. Um, because what she emphasized is what our political traditions and practices and political culture have become about the role of these electors. And of course, it would be a very da dangerous thing, I think, for the system and for American democracy, you know, if somehow we had these votes and electors could basically ignore them um, and, and vote for whomever they wanted. So that's a great example, I think, of the court adapting the original constitution to more modern understandings of what a presidential election is and has been for, you know, 100 or more years in the United States. But there's a limit to how much courts can do that with institutions that are hardwired in the Constitution. You know, the same with the Senate. Uh, originally, the, the population disparity between the largest and the smallest state was like 13 to 1. Uh, now it's over 70 to 1. So it's kind of a different institution in some ways. But again, the Supreme Court's not going to hold the Senate unconstitutional. Um, and we're not going to change the Senate uh, without a constitutional amendment, and that's highly unlikely. So there is a tension uh, between how we would design some of these institutions if we were doing it on a blank slate today in a more modern democratic culture than the one from 1789, but or 1787, whatever date you want to use. Uh, but but there are limits to that, and. Um, uh, you know, one of the, we, we can debate various questions about institutional design mistakes the framers might have made. Maybe life tenure for federal judges was one of them. No other country has that system. It worked to create an incredibly independent federal judiciary. So in one sense, successful. Um, uh, maybe making the constitution so hard to amend, you know, among the hardest in the world, later democracies that formed constitutions didn't think it should be that hard. Um, you know, maybe that was that was a mistake. By the way, I'm getting off point here, but I think the two year terms for members of the House was probably a mistake. That's too that that's too much instability too too quickly in the system. And it doesn't give governance enough chance to kind of actually, you know, make decisions, adopt policy, see how they play out. But anyway, I'm going uh, off into different uh, territories, but you're, you're right. The paradox of our constitution is that because it is so old, because we are the longest continuous constitutional democracy, which is something to celebrate, it also has this sort of you know, paradoxical effect that there are things that were hardwired in long ago that are extremely difficult to change. So, so Ben, I wanna ask you about several of the things that Rick, or just to respond, but before I wanna push you on something that I've thought about for a long time. And I've not, I don't think I've ever raised with you. I thought that the Republicans in Bush v. Gore did a masterful job of setting up the litigation on just the terms that Rick has just identified. That is, you led with the equal protection claim of the rights of the voter in the Florida context, even though 
that's the last actor who appears in a presidential election. And even the Supreme Court in giving you all the relief you wanted was forced to say, of course, no one has the right to vote for president. So in some ways, I thought you were, you were uh, marshalling both the democratic sentiment and the structure to create a very novel set of arguments that were not quite textually rooted. <laughs> Thank you, I think. <laughs> you know, I, I'm, but, but honestly, part of the argument was born on the reality of the fact. Talk about stress testing institutions for the first time, which is, um, it, it was all really rooted on the fact that the evidence that we had was that similarly marked ballots were being treated differently uh, depending on who was looking at them. And that was true not only from county to county, but also within individual counties. And so at that point, uh, an equal protection claim based on the right of, of every voter to have his or her vote counted the same way uniformly um, became kind of a became kind of the gravamon of the whole uh, enterprise that was going on. So, you know, would we have had that argument if the Democrats hadn't only asked for a recount in their four best counties in the state and it had been a uniform statewide recount? I'm not sure. The Florida Supreme Court had stepped in and offered uniform standards, uh, right, the, in line with the instructions on the voting machines that you have to push through every chat all the way through, that would have been an absolute standard you could have done a uniform recount by. So the argument um, that you're referring to is I think reflective of the actual factual situation on the ground and what was, what was being done in individual counting houses. Well, let me push you then, because uh, you're going to think I set you up for this question. And I, I am. You're right. I partially did. Um, <laughs> so here's here's the question. So let me give you a hypothetical in my law professor role. Imagine a candidate in 2020 who decides to pay for a recount in a state and only in the two counties that went against him and are the only two heavily black counties in a particular state and wants to disregard a recount everywhere else. Isn't that exactly, and obviously I'm describing the Trump campaign's um, uh, actions in Wisconsin right now, isn't that exactly the way you characterize what the Florida Democrats had done in 2000? I have to confess, when I read this, I thought th they just, took one of my exam hypotheticals and just tried to do it in real life. But it strikes me that this is exactly what you complained about in Florida. Yeah, I, I, think, that's, I think that's a totally fair point. Um, I don't understand that strategy. I don't think it's, it's, a, it's gonna be an effective strategy for a number of reasons. First of all, uh, you know, the mantra among recount lawyers is, good areas get better in a recount and bad areas get worse. And so if you really were doing a recount, uh, you, you, would, you would recount a lot of other areas too. So I, I, think, I think as in many things that the Trump campaign has, has done, it is a flawed strategy. I mean, it also goes to the fact that the way they do a recount on the machines used in, in both um, Dane County, Madison, and Milwaukee, which is the other one, is that you take the ballots and you put them through the machine and it's fill in the oval technology. Uh, so it's pretty straightforward. And by the way, if somebody doesn't fill in a ballot, right, the voter feeds the ballot into the voting machines and it gets kicked out if the machine can't read a vote. So under no circumstances is a recount in Milwaukee and Dane County is going to going to produce a change in a 20,000 vote uh, margin. 
Yeah, at least so the, I don't understand any of it on either theoretical or practical grounds. At least the Democrats in Florida were smart enough to ask for recount in the counties where their votes were. So. Yeah, in the four best counties. Good gets <laughs> better, bad gets worse, right? Yeah. Uh, so, Fernita, let's uh, let's move to the uh, we have some questions on this from the audience also. Um, in terms of uh, reforms, uh, Ben raised the issue that as a policy matter, what the uh, what's up before the court could go either way. Could, should we have the state legislature? Should we have courts involved? Does it make a difference that the Pennsylvania Supreme Court is also elected? Um, uh, let's. Uh, it's it's hard to see that we're going to get a lot of really dynamic legislation out of the next Congress. Uh, in any form, uh, but let's imagine that there are certain uh, uh, reforms under the uh, Federal Elections uh, Clause of Article One of the Constitution, under the Elections Clause of the Constitution. Um, what would it look like? What, what's the package right now that would you would think would best sort of start retrofitting onto the problems we've seen this cycle? Um, so one thing I would love to see just as a general matter is automatic voter registration for federal elections. Uh, that would make me happy. <laughs> I would like to see HR uh, one pass too. That would also make me happy, right? This idea of independent uh, commissions for, um, for federal elections, uh, for congressional districts and uh, re-enfranchising uh, people who have felony convictions for purposes of voting in federal elections. And, and so there are definitely proposals out there, Sam. Um, uh, but to be honest, we are still limited in what we can do. And part of it is that we need a constitutional right to vote. As long as we are living in a world where the court interprets the scope of the right to vote based on their own case law and their own perception that the right is inferred, then we will necessarily have the situation where the court is prioritizing state sovereignty over everything else. Um, and to come back to a point that Rick made, um, it'll be very hard to have any changes to our system permanently in part because of this, this notion that you can't, the level of commitment necessary for constitutional change is absent in part because partisans don't know what will happen if they change the rules. And as long as that's the case, this is why we haven't had a constitutional amendment since what, 92 and it was about congressional pay raises. Like who the hell cares about that, right? Like, but it's just, it's really hard to get changes to the, huh? 530. <laughs> 535 people well, out of 350 times two, million. Times two for spouses. <laughs> <Right. laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's hard to, to think about what is capable, what, what kind of change is actually realistic in a system where everything is run by partisans. And, and so maybe that goes to like the core change that we need, right? The fact that we don't need partisans running our system of election. We need national election administration um, but I know that that's a non-starter because one of the benefits that's often touted about our system is the fact that decentralization prevents hacking and a number of other concerns uh, that could arise from having a uniform system. I get that, but this cannot be the path forward. Um, so much of our history has been us governing and having elections by chaos, right? So the 1887 Electoral Count Act, uh, one of the things that is very striking about it to me is the fact that they didn't pass it immediately after the 1876 election, even though that was a, almost a disaster. We almost had dueling inaugurations disaster, right? They had to have two other close elections before they finally said, all right, you know, maybe this is a little broken, right? Um, and, and in reality, in 150 years, we haven't really gotten away from this. Let's change things after there's some disaster that could derail the entire system. And so, yes, there needs to be change. And probably the number one change is we need to have nonpartisan something, uh, but it will require partisans to implicate it to implement that rule. And I don't, I don't know how we get there. Can I offer just a mild, uh, optimistic uh, perspective? No, Not Rick, I need you to be story. negative with me. Well, no, <laughs> look, I, I totally agree. It's going to be very hard to make significant <laughs> changes, but you know, here is one positive story. Florida was a disaster in 2000. It became completely obvious to the country and to the courts uh, and to people in Florida, um, including political actors in Florida. And Florida undertook a very rigorous, very comprehensive set of reforms to its election process. I believe Jeb Bush you know, led that effort um, and they made a whole series of changes to their election system. 
And, you know, come 2020, Florida, which is, again, is, you know, thought to be a critical state, Florida had one of the smoothest elections of any of these states. And it's a huge state, of course, big population, very different geography and politics and culture in different parts of the state. And the reason Florida was not Pennsylvania this term, this, this in this election, or was not Florida of 2000, is exactly because they had implemented a whole series of comprehensive <coughs> election uh, reforms. And not only do they run a very smooth election, but they had designed the system so that on election night, they were able to report not just the in-person voting totals, but a very high percentage of the absentee ballots that had been cast there. Because one of the changes was they allowed their election officials to start three weeks in advance of election day, processing the absentee ballots that came in. So, you know, that is a, that's a positive story of one state that was a disaster 20 years later, I mean, these changes went into effect much earlier, but you know, when the system came under tremendous stress again in 2020, everything worked very nicely. So um, you know, maybe it's easier at the state level than it would be at the national level um, as states look at problems in their system in this election uh, that you know, we, could get, we could get some movement. That's just a can I chime in here really quickly? Because I actually want to say something in response to that. I think you're right, but I worry about how we define success, right? So it is true that Florida, uh, actually for like the last three election cycles have been able to report their results and it's fine. But part of that is because they have, you know, really disenfranchised segments of their population that could potentially make the vote closer, right? F Florida folded in 2000 in part because the, the two candidates were so close, right? And, and, and in that situation, every vote counts. We have no idea how Florida will operate in a situation where if two candidates are close again, and one of the reasons why they avoided a, a, a huge fallout this cycle is because uh, the state legislature made it very difficult for amendment for it to live up to its purpose. Imagine the conversation we would be having if the individuals with felony convictions were able to vote in Florida, if the Florida vote was closer than it was, uh, will we have the same optimism about the Florida system? I'm not sure, maybe, right? Because they did make changes in response to 2000. That point is well taken. But I do, want, I do worry that we are defining success in a way where we just focused on outcome and we're ignoring the pe people who are getting lost in the process. So yeah, so look, well, I want to say that is a fair point. And, and you know, the, 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 the issues about who should be eligible to participate are a very important set of issues. And you're right, I wasn't talking about that. I, within the universe of people that you know are eligible to participate, how do you run the system? And and I was focusing on that. And you're right to remind us of you know that issue uh, in Florida uh, that was resolved against uh, allowing uh, uh, people who still had outstanding fines and couldn't afford to pay them uh, to be able to participate uh, even after that constitutional amendment. Uh, and I think I think we're in a much more difficult place in terms of how we're talking about reform now than in Florida. Florida was a mechanical failure of all of old machines and not so difficult to come up with the solution for that. The problems in 2020 didn't really get focused on much, maybe Pennsylvania, in the states we were looking at. But the four of us are all sitting in jurisdictions that I don't think have tabulated their votes yet. Uh, for one reason or another. So the real, you know, the real, the real poster children examples of an election system that has not gotten its act together to get the results timely are California, New York, and we'll throw in the District of Columbia, which is not necessarily as, as significant. Um, and, and, and by the way, the problem that's caused there is not old machines breaking down, although that's part of it. The the public policy reason for the delays is the belief that you enfranchise more voters by extending deadlines. And so that is a considered a virtue by many to count more votes. So we're going to, you know, give procrastinators three more weeks to get their ballots in. Uh, but that causes the election potential crisis dysfunction of not getting results in a timely fashion and letting conspiracy theories fly. 
So to really reform what I think the issue is this time, you're gonna to have to deal with a much more difficult issue of extending deadlines to enfranchise people or get results quickly for election administration purposes. And that's a lot tougher nut to crack than the Florida uh, situation. Ben can, I, ben, can I ask you a question? Cause I'm very curious about your views on this. Um, so, uh, so much of the national election process, of course, is run by state law and, and, and administered in the states. And there are good reasons for that. Uh, but one of the things that I have been thinking about more after watching this election cycle is it's incredibly bad for the system that we have the same fights over and over in different states about things, sort of the technical aspects of, of the process. Like, uh, when can you request an absentee ballot? When do you have to get the absentee ballot back? Uh, is there no excuse absentee voting? Or should you be able to vote absentee only for certain reasons? Um, and, uh, you know, I have been wondering, and I've said it for you, things like this in public, about whether it would be better to have national legislation on some of these issues. Let's have these fights out once at the national level. Neither side is gonna get completely what it wants. On many of these issues, it's more important that the policy be clearly settled than what the exact content of the policy is. And courts, I think, are gonna be a lot more reluctant to overturn congressional legislation on these issues. Um, the national process is incredibly more transparent and accessible than the process in the states. You know, even though I'm sure you do start from a strong, you know, preference to have a lot of this done at the state level, or at least I would assume that, um, do you think we actually would be better off by resolving some of these issues for national elections through national legislation? Uh, uh, I mean, look, I think the chances of national solutions to these problems are slim and nil. In, in, a, in a country as divided as we are, um, I do think that the road to more uniformity and therefore more efficient administration uh, would be for individual states to make their uh, administration of elections uniform within the states so that you preserve the, the, right, the state's rights of, of some local control, but you don't have 10,500 di different jurisdictions around the country doing counting and casting. So it seems to me to be both more efficient and acceptable from a state's rights perspective to uh, have states be uniform within their states. Which, well, by the way, Georgia is, a, is, is the best example of that. The Georgia, with 159 counties, the second greatest in the country, does all use the same voting machine, or almost every county uses the same voting machine. And so a hand recount in Georgia was really tremendously, and to me, surprisingly efficiently done. So that is an example of how uniformity within a state can actually make things a lot better. I agree with that. I want to be a little bit more optimistic. I think that there's a lot of one of the lessons I think from 2020 and what we're hearing uh, from you all today is that there's a lot of lurking daggers out there aimed at the heart of the election system and in any particular election we will discover a new frailty and, and have to worry about that. But there seems to me to be uh, a set of ideas that across the partisan aisle that perhaps would allow federal legislation on the conduct of federal elections and thereby set a baseline for what the minimum must be at the state level. I agree with you, Ben. If you look at the change from the primary elections, from just the mechanical handling of elections under COVID in, in April, May, June of this year, and what happened in November, it's a tribute to the innovation and skill and dedication of campaign uh, officials, election officials around the country. It's just remarkable that we pulled off the biggest uh, concentration of votes ever uh, in under these kinds of conditions. It's amazing. It's also true, as Fernita said, that we escape most problems because of the size of the margin. I would 
respond a little bit, Ben, I think the most dysfunctional election administration unit in the country is New York City. And my good neighbors of New York know how many polling sites are open, how many early voting sites are open in Harris County, and they're very worked up about the perfidy of Texas. But meanwhile, I would take Texas elections, and I used to be a resident of Texas, I'd take Texas election administration over New York's any day of the week. And so we get away from it because nobody cares whether the votes are counted this week, next week, or in two months. In Brooklyn, it doesn't matter. But fortunately, it doesn't matter. But let me go back to this. Republicans believe that the late counting was a tremendous source of potential fraud, fraud, whatever plan you want. Democrats believe that some of the administrative mechanisms were used to disenfranchise people. It seems to me that a legislative deal could at least be structured that would give on both sides of this. And one of the skills of a Biden presidency may be that he is the most knowledgeable about legislative president we've had about legislative pathways since Lyndon Johnson. And maybe there is capacity to use the reserve federal power, which is basically untapped under the elections clause, to start pushing through reforms that are systematic, including voter registration, making sure the lists are good, right? That's a Republican issue. It's also a Democratic issue. So I'm not as, as, uh, as negative on the prospect of actually doing something intelligent out of this. Uh, I, I would I would hope that you're right. I, I I suspect that the way you would have to go about it is honestly not give it to the to the Congress or legislatures in the first instance. I mean, I, I think this is a time for bipartisan national commissions to look at this issue and make recommendations and do and do the hard work first. I think Congress is going to have enough on its plate and is, you know, the, the House is closer uh, between the parties. The Senate is. Uh, they don't trust each other much. I just don't think Congress is going to be the breeding ground of ideas to reform the system. But I do think that, um, that the wily political operatives on both sides of the aisle do see advantages to what you're talking about. So it's not like I don't think there is a deal possible. I'm not sure I think there's a deal possible right now in Congress without a bipartisan group uh, sort of developing it and, and making it available to Congress. But let me push you just a little bit further on that, Ben, because you were part of the Bauer Ginsburg. You were the Ginsburg of Bauer Ginsburg, right? This was a commission set up under President Obama to look at election reforms. Um, and most of the reforms were directed to the state level administration and what could be done that way. Are you talking about having a second Bauer Ginsburg or whomever uh, might be the designees look at federal power in elections? I mean, because that was really not your focus the last time around. Well, specifically not our focus the last time around. I, I, I do think that you would impanel a commission to look at election reforms that are needed. And you would put on the table this time, I believe, potential federal reforms, acknowledging how difficult and untraditional uh, it was. If we, if we had included federal reforms in, in our commission back in 2013 and 2014, uh, it would not have gone anywhere. It would have it was one of those issues that just would have stopped us from getting anywhere. And we were acknowledging that the states really had the responsibility, all the responsibility for doing elections. Uh, I think it is at least in theory possible to look at what you're talking about on the federal level, but I also think you would have to get buy-in from all the states to, um, to, to make it work on a federal level. And I'm not sure what the specific provisions that would work federally would be. Right, so Franita, let me turn to you on that because you brought up uh, 
House Bill 1 as an example, it is extremely unlikely that a bipartisan consensus or bipartisan commission could push through all of those reforms. What would be, what could you take off the table as it were in order to try to get some kind of meaningful federal reform agenda that might actually have a chance of getting through a, at best a 50-50 uh, Senate? What would I take off the table? Well, for example, it's unlikely in my view that this Congress will pass a restoration of the Voting Rights Act preclearance uh, mechanism in even if it's designed to hit only four states. Um, what, what uh, you know, yeah. the reform agenda turned out just to be the administration, turned out to be just voter registration, what the effective election day must be, when absentee ballots have to be returned by, uh, the processing of absentee ballots ahead of time. Um, do you think that could fly politically? That's a, it, for some reason, I'm finding that question incredibly difficult. I think that Ben's answer just explained why my scholarship wasn't very popular in 2012 and 2013, right? Because <laughs> I'm like, I think the federal government can do all of these things, but uh, I, don't, I don't think there's really political will for anything to happen. I don't think anything is going, I don't think HR1 is going to make it through. I don't think HR4, I don't, I don't think they'll see any movement on the Voting Rights Act. I don't think that, like for me, the thing that I think would be most effective at this point in time, just turn into the future. I really like the idea of the independent commissions to draw congressional districts. We are on the eve of another cycle. Like to me, that seems like that could be a huge change that's meaningful. Um, but, you know, it's hard to see, and, and for many of the reasons that Rick articulated, um, I just don't think that um, anything will, will happen. I just don't, I, you know, and, and Ben talked about the, the lack of trust in Congress and stuff. That doesn't mean that um, change can't happen. And, and to some extent, when Ben was talking, I was, I was thinking about the Bauer Ginsburg Commission and wondering if we needed to dust off uh, that report um, and, and, and sort of revive some of those state level suggestions because I, I just, I'm not very optimistic about Congress being able to move on, on many of these things unless the Georgia Senate races turn out different, you know, turn out to a certain way, which is, is highly unlikely. The, the frame of reference, I think, needs to be changed. HR1 and HR4 were both partisan bills drafted in the anticipation of uh, big democratic wins right. on the congressional level. And you know, the people spoke with a different voice. Mm -hmm. So HR1 and HR4 are not the model for going forward. If you really wanna get something through Congress, you better figure out a, a bipartisan approach, e even if Democrats win both of the, of the Georgia races. But to be fair, what, like what though? You know, and I guess this comes back to Sam's question. I don't, I just, it's hard for me to think of anything that both parties could coalesce around. Um, well, let me, let me offer one thought on that. So both at the time of the Bauer Ginsburg Commission and even at the time of HR1, no one was focused very much on the absentee ballot process because it just wasn't that big a part of the system. So now we suddenly have on visible to everybody, all of these issues about the absentee ballot process. Now, you know, the other thing that was interesting in this election is a lot of states where Republicans control the legislature or the governorship expanded early voting options for this election. Um, you know, Texas is an interesting example because the governor there, uh, although, you know, he was, Texas was in the national news constantly about challenges to their voting processes, one of the things that he quietly did that got much less national attention is he expanded early voting by six days. So, and South Carolina, for example, you know, expanded early voting. So I wonder if there's some kind of package that could be put together where there's, you know, some ground given by each side about the absentee process, but some ground given about expanding early voting, you know, some, yeah, I think thinking in those ways, you know, what can each side gain? What's the benefit to each side? Or what is one side getting and then the other side is getting? And narrowing the focus to things that are more administrative aspects of the system, like these issues about absentee ballots. 
you know, maybe that's the kind of way to think about the narrow, narrow window that might conceivably be open. I don't know. Well, well here's, that, here's that the bud. <laughs> sorry, Dan, go ahead, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, here's the bud of a potentially hopeful part. If you look at the, the cases that Trump campaign and Republican Party brought pre-election, they were, I think, really wrongfully and almost shame, shamefully designed to stop, to not make it easy to vote for groups that they thought were not going to be supportive of Donald Trump and Republicans. In fact, at least from the preliminary election results, uh, Donald Trump and Republicans did beat expectations amongst Latino communities, African-American communities, many other communities. And so uh, part of these compromises or new ways forward we're talking about is a realization that the Republican Party has to go through that um, you cannot be afraid of these, of, of the emerging demographic communities, that trying to to make it more difficult for people in those communities to vote. It's a self-defeating process. It's not gonna work. It's not the right policy. It's not the right politics. And the results when you know folks get to look at them more may show that that's true, that it does make sense for Republicans to come up with conservative principles that appeal to the emerging demographic communities. So that is, that, and that would translate down into the the blocking and tackling of voting administration and things like making it easier to vote and providing reforms that way. Yeah. Okay, Fernita, we are almost out of time. You get the last minute. Okay, cool. great. Um, so I just wanted to say something that's actually responsive to both of those points, so perfect. So the first is that um, part of my skepticism is that things are now partisan and political in a way that just simply weren't wasn't true before. And maybe that's just a reflection of every election cycle. So. Um, absentee voting is now a partisan issue that for me makes it difficult to think about a path forward. But to Ben's point, to what extent did the high turnout in this recent presidential election disturb this view that you know high turnout is bad for Republicans? The, the answer is it's not necessarily bad, right? And so if the party is willing to embrace that, then perhaps there is a package that can be put together uh, because you know certain assumptions may not hold anymore such that they may welcome higher levels of political participation. And so maybe that's the, I, I get to end on an optimistic note. So that's, that's really great. So maybe that provides an opening for a path forward. Okay, well, let me uh, thank our panelists. Um, I have tried to infuse questions from the chat into the discussion as best I could. I'm sorry I didn't get to all of them, but uh, there were a lot. Um, so again, thank you so much for doing this. It is my fond hope that we will not meet again in a month, although it's my fonder hope that we will meet in person somewhere in a month, but I don't think that's likely either. Uh, thank you all so much for doing this. Uh, this was really enlightening for all of us. Thanks and goodbye.